webcam on. Let me uh, make sure that we're in the right neighborhood here. We are. And let me try to this. Uh, yeah, so basically my power, I had like a little brownout and it, the power dipped enough to shut down the computer, shut down my feed, just all the things you don't want to happen. Um, but I just want to make sure that we should be back in now. Let me enlarge this. Computer shut down my feed. There we go. Okay. Just all the things you don't Quiet. Want to happen. We've already heard uh, you. And uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, my apologies for that. Uh, that was weird. Um, I'm not sure how that happened, but oh, I don't want to add to the queue. I just want to open this up. And then, of course, Facebook makes me um, do a whole stop it. YouTube is so weird now. You know, YouTube didn't used to be that weird, but it's kind of weird now. Uh, skip ads and do things and it's it's just strange. Um, Okay, I gotta start this YouTube page up. What did I do here? There we go, that's what I wanted to do. Let me close this. Go back and close the player. Thank you. I gotta go find my feeds just to make sure everybody's still seeing what they need to see. So I apologize for this. Um, kind of took the wind out of my sails. I believe we're back in shape here. Yeah, so we'll call this part two is what I'm calling this. We're calling this part two <laughs> and we'll see if we can get back into this. So where was I? I was sharing things. I had one more thing to show you before we were so rudely interrupted. I apologize for that. So I'm going to switch over to, if I can get this mouse to work right here, I'm going to switch over to my Chrome browser. I have a one set up here. Let me switch to that view so you can see it. And hopefully that'll switch over for you and you can see this last base that I was going to be showing off. And it's not, I have to go find it. So give me just one second here. It, uh, I have to figure out how to do this where I can actually just flip in because of the streaming software I use. Sometimes I have to actually find the exact window and set that up. Um, window capture. Oh, where are you window capture? Is this it? That's it. Okay. That's it. And we're back to this. Okay. And I'm going to go to my full screen here so I can see it for myself. Okay, this is the last example. My apologies. This is a little bit more of a show than I had intended. This is an example of a quarter sawn white oak uh, with a logo with a storage compartment. And this used to be like not my as high priced item, but now these are pretty high priced because of the quarter sawn, like I said, the quarter sawn white oak. I don't even bother using it pretty much anymore um, just because it is expensive. Until the price goes back down, uh, I don't know that I'm going to be using a lot of quarter sawn white oak. Anyway, let me get into the details of this so you can see. This is the logo that I carve on my CNC machine. This is the standard logo that I use. Um, I added the little furly things on the side. That's what I'm calling them, furly things. I added those on the side. The Singer logo is the vintage Singer logo. I think I mentioned this before we were browned out, is that that particular logo uh, is no longer trademark um, enforced. Uh, the trademark on that expired and they did not renew it. Uh, there are some other Singer logos that are still trademarked, um, but this one is not. So I don't feel like I have any issues using this one. It's kind of out there in the wild. Uh, especially since this logo was from the mid 1800s, give or take is when this logo came about. And it's kind of classic because it's on the, it's built into the iron legs of the machines and on the badges for the machines. And it's pretty much everywhere on a Singer machine. You can find this old logo if it's, if it's that old. Um, and so I really think it's great. It's carved into the piece. Uh, it's not laser etched, it's carved in, and it's, to me, it just looks fantastic. I don't have to do really a whole lot to make it stand out like that, because as I'm carving in, it makes the wood surface, it kind of exposes rougher wood underneath the carving, 
and that soaks up more stain. So even though I wipe the stain off, uh, the darkness stays in the, in the carved area. So it really gives a nice contrast and you can really see that really well. Um, the other thing I was going to show you is I'm trying to explain those medullary rays. So they show up really well on the side here. So you see these swirls. This is the grain going across here and that's quarter sawn. So you can see it's very straight, but in the side, you can see these swirling rays right here that kind of are swooping back and forth. Those are called medullary rays. And that is, um, it's, it's, was more prevalent uh, back in the, like I said, the mid 1800s through the early 1900s. This was used a ton in furniture making, cabinet making, all kinds of stuff. In fact, they would actually do, a lot of the stuff was veneered because it was so pretty and hard to get. They would actually make veneers of this stuff to make their, their medullary ray wood go further. But uh, I look for pieces when I go to pick out quarter saw and white oak, I'm looking for pieces that have really well-defined medullary rays because to me that kind of makes it stand out and looks great. Um, I mean, like I said, another standard base. I only do the engraving on one side. This has the, uh, the side compartment. There you can see there's the side compartment, there's the lid, uh, and then there's the corner pieces that I use inside there. And just that standard piece of plywood in the bottom. There's the lid on the side. There's the lid installed in there. This one had a little, sometimes I get a little fancy with uh, with things. Let me show, see if I can see that. Yeah, so this one right here, I kind of did a little angled up area on this handle. And to tell you the truth, I had a chip out in there and there was no way to really repair it. So I kind of modified it to be part of the aesthetic of the base. That's kind of what you got to do when you're a woodworker. You know, you just go with the flow and take what they give you. Um, but it, it was almost ruined and I figured out, oh, let me try this. Um, that This is one of the reasons why I switched to the method I use now for making my, my handles in the sides of my boards. Because I did, I would get these chip outs and there was no other way to repair them. And it was basically just pieces of wood that had to be thrown away now because they were damaged and destroyed. And it was all because the router bit would catch on this long grain going across here and then chip it out. And it really... I tried a lot of different bits and stuff, and I really had a hard time doing that. Anywho, enough of that nonsense. That kind of gives you an idea. If you didn't understand what it was I was talking about when I said, uh, let me just go back to my view here so I can see what I'm doing. If you didn't understand what I was always talking about when I'm talking about making bases, that's, those are my bases. That's what I make. And depending on whether it's going to have that storage compartment or not, it needs either just two sides if it's a standard base like this one right here this one's a little shorter and has just two sides because this is just going to be a standard size base this one right here and the, re the remaining four of these you can see that this one is much longer and that additional length is going to accommodate for that storage compartment also because of the storage compartment i need two ends so i have two boards for an end but then i need another board that is actually, so you're going to have one, two, and then three. So you're going to have three boards going across. Two of these are going to be for the sewing machine. The furthest one out is for the compartment. So I need three of these boards like this. Additionally, the one that goes in the middle, because it actually sets on top of the, the, the bottom, it doesn't go all the way through the base. It sits on top of the bottom. So this one is going to be, one of these is going to be shorter, um, not as wide but I don't usually do that until after I've got everything kind of cut and figured out. And then I can, that's an easy run it through the table saw to get the, the width that I need on that. Okay. Whoo, long way around. What time is it here? It is 1149. I've spent 49 minutes. I, I don't feel like I've done anything. Well, I did show you what the bases look like and we talked a little bit about wood and such. So, you know, it's always a good day when you can talk about wood at least in my world, because I don't know if you can see my sticker back here, but wood is good. That actually came from the, uh, one of the local hardwood places that I had that was 10 minutes from my house. They had great wood and they closed. It's called Hardwoods in the Rough and I missed them so much because it was 10 minutes away from my house. It was a little more expensive than where I go now, but, and they didn't have quite the variety, but it was still not bad and 10 minutes from my house. 10, not an hour, 10. 
Okay, uh, enough crying on my side. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make those, um, the handles that I put into the bases. The way I do that is, let me uh, see what I've got here for another view here. Um, not that camera, this camera. Does that camera work? Yeah, we'll try that one to start with. Over here at my CNC machine, I have uh, a computer set up. I used to have a laptop. That's what this drawer was for right here. It's like I could just stick the laptop in here and it actually is on runners. So I could just pull it out and have the laptop sitting here. But my little laptop died. So I ended up getting this monitor and I actually have a small computer on the back of it, which actually is really cool. It's just a little small Windows PC thing. You don't need a lot of horsepower to run a router. All you're doing is sending code um, to the controller. You're sending code to the controller, so it, uh, it flows from here into here. It's just, it's ones and zeros, basically. So you don't need a lot of horsepower. You're not, you're not doing any gaming or any intense graphics stuff or anything. So let me go into my uh, web browser here. And I got this little, this got kind of cool. It's a little Logitech wireless uh, keyboard and mouse. It's got a little pad here. So I don't have to be hardwired in. I can use this from across the room if I want to. And uh, let me find my, um, so I use, this is a, uh, an X-Carve which means I use their software for it. You don't have to, but I just find that their software for what I do um, works really well. There's a lot of people that will use like VCarve Pro and things like that. That is not really necessary for me. Um, oh, why, 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 why did you not put that in there? Try that one. Okay, why, why, why? Oh, uh, you know, Sometimes when you, um, uh, when you update things, when you update your computer, let me try this one. No, it didn't like that one. Oh my God, this is so much fun. I can't tell you how much fun this is. Is that right? No, it's not. Enter? No, okay. Um, all right, this is so much fun, I can't even believe it. Is it this one? It was that one. Okay, I only have like a dozen passwords that I use and I sometimes forget. Um, I don't want you to check the password. If you remember the password, that would be awesome. Project, oh, whoop. Oh no, wrong one. Okay, hang on, that's, oops, wrong account. I've got two accounts on here, that's not the right account. Although there was some cool stuff there. Um, should be this one. There we go. There we go. All right, I have a lot of different projects saved on here, but this is the one that I need to. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna carve a pocket. So let me, uh, let me turn this camera on here and I'm gonna show you um, what I'm gonna do here. Let me see if that worked. It did. Okay, so I'm gonna make a pocket let me make sure I get the wood here. So if I'll take two of these that are the two sides that are going to go on the, the, the base. And on the two sides, I'll figure out, okay, well, which is my outside of my, of my base? Which is going to be the, what's going to be the outside? So I kind of look for the prettier wood and such. Then where's the bottom and what's going to be the top? So is it going to be sit like this? If it sits like this, right? And um, like this, and then this This is the bottom, this is the top, and this is the outside face. So the handle needs to go right here. And I'll figure that out for both of these. Okay, and that's kind of nice right there. Then I'll take those bottoms and I put them together. And then I will squeeze these together on uh, with some clamps on the CNC machine. And then what I do is I cut handles out of here. I don't know if you can see that, but anyway. The handles get cut out of this middle section here. That's really hard to see, isn't it? You know what? I'm just gonna do it like this. So the handles get cut out of the middle like that. When you separate the pieces of wood, now I've got a handle on this side, a handle on this side, and then those will sit on the ground like that. And then it will create a handle that you can lift this whole thing up with. So that's how I go about that. I guess I better mill these out because 
<laughs> I've got magic marker on them now. Anyway, so that's how I set these up on here. Let me go back to this camera. Yeah. And so I've set these up on my CNC machine. I leave this pattern on here so that I can always use it now. I just go back and say, okay, well, I'm going to do some, some handles. And I just go back and find what I need. And uh, I'm looking for my little wrench right here. I made these are stops. There's uh, threaded inserts in the table that I can put uh, screw down uh, hold downs into. But these are like little bumper stops that I made on the CNC machine. Um, the problem I have, this is, a, this is a, a weak point with this particular machine, is that these threaded inserts, I think they're made out of aluminum. Uh, they're pretty lightweight and they actually start to... Um, you can break them off after a while. If you put too much, too much uh, tightening pressure, they'll break off. And I've, I've broken several of them now and I'm kind of running out. So I'm gonna have to actually go in and redo a whole bunch of these um, threaded inserts. I think they sell them on their website. They really should. I believe they sell them on the website, but um, I'm gonna have to go back in and replace a ton of these that I've broken. But it, the problem it makes for me is that now I have to be really selective about where I place my, uh, my projects. How do I have this running? I have it running lengthwise. Uh, so I'm going to run the boards this way. So I need to get all of these things out of the way. Can you see this at all? Yeah, I think you can. Try to be not blocking your view. So these boards will sit in here like this. And I need to rearrange some of these that are set up from a different project that I was doing. <coughs> Excuse me. But I don't have this attached. Let me attach this just so it, hopefully it's not going to, there we go. Just need to attach that. It was kind of flopping down. So let me get these out of the way and then we will um, try to create a uh, t we're going to squeeze these together as best we can using these. Now I'm going to slide this over a little further and I'm going to use these. I got these little Allen wrench things. These are Husky brand. Um, they're really nice. They're little T handles. Uh, they're really great, especially for things where you're going to be doing a lot of turning of hex nuts and such. Um, so I got a packet of like a whole variety of sizes and these things are super handy, especially for doing stuff like this. All right, let me get this one lined up. I think this is actually a good spot for this. The nice thing is once I get these things set up and I get one, one board or one uh, pass of these done, it's just a matter of loosening the uh, one set of these hold downs, popping those boards out and sliding a new set in, and it just goes on from there. So I just, I just keep going. Now, see if this is, what I wanna do is get this, I need another set here. So like I said, I'm trying to maximize my, my threaded hold downs and put these in the place where they will give me the best pressure. Cause that's the thing is I need pressure on the all sides of the wood so that they don't shift. You don't want these things shifting while you're, while you're actually applying a router bit to them. So that looks good. I need to make sure they're square though. So let me loosen this one and this one. Um, there is a grid on the table here. And so I will use that to line up the edge of the boards and then I will slide the, these things against the wood to keep them straight. And then I can apply pressure to this one. Just tighten these down. And uh, there are traditional hold downs that you can use for this table too, which uses these little plastic 
tabs and they are stair stepped on one end so you can you know set them on these things and then you use one of these little these little handle things and drill through and it'll put pressure down on your wood i, I don't like using those all the time they're not as consistent to me as this system that i'm using here so but i do use them for little spacers in here sometimes all right let me get this last one set up here and i think that's going to be in good shape. Now, the one thing I need to do is find the center point of my board here. I didn't do that before I, um, and I can pull these out before I lock this one down. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'll switch back over to here. I don't know why this keeps doing that. Okay. So am I on four? Yeah. There we go. Let me just check my feed here real quick because I think we're still good. We are. Okay, so when I'm gonna do these, this is the one that I just drew on right here. You can see that, hopefully. There we go, right there. I need to find a center point because that's what I'm gonna use to be my starting point for um, the CNC machine. You have to tell the CNC machine, you have to give it a starting point. Either a lot of people will use the, the corner um, or the very center of where the cutout's gonna be, but it has to know where that bit is in space before it starts doing anything. So what I'm gonna do is define my center point, and that's just a really simple operation. I just get a pencil and a, a ruler here. I'm gonna line these up, and I'm just gonna go from corner to corner and hopefully keep these boards together like this and then find my corner and then draw a line this way, do it the other direction. And wherever these two lines intersect on that space between the wood, or you know, where the, I can't get a pencil that actually has a lead that wants to come out. Okay, and then that lets me know that my center point is basically right here where the two pieces touch and those lines intersect. So now I have a place where I can go through. Let me see if I can show you that a little better. There you go. So you can see that little X on there and pull them apart, put them together. There you go. That little X shows me the center point and that's where I'm going to align my, my bit as the center point for the cut that it's gonna be making. I'm gonna put this in here and I'm putting pressure against the side of this as I tighten these down. I'm gonna use this, it's a little faster if I use this to get it close. And I'm not clamping these down like super tight. Um, the pressure of this screw holds it in place really well. You don't have to you don't have to really crank down on these, they'll hold. But the big thing is I do not want this wood to shift left, right, back, forth. So there it is, that's, that's that. Uh, my next step is I need to replace this bit. It's a, I've got an eighth inch bit in there right now. And the bit that I use for doing these is a, um, it's a spiral bit. It's a quarter inch spiral bit and uh, I think it does a nice job. Uh, you know, I don't use quarter inch size bits in here a lot because I'm usually doing, usually doing smaller, um, let's see, there we go. Lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. But I'm usually doing smaller cuts. So I use smaller bits like eighth inch or 16 inch bits, or I use a V bit for doing like uh, letters and such. When I get ready to do the, the emblem on the front, the little logo, I will be using a, um, a V bit. But for these, because I'm just basically carving out a pocket in this wood, um, I find that this little quarter inch spiral bit does a nice job. So let me get this locked in here. And I uh, replaced the collet on this. This is a standard, the, the, when you, I bought the machine, I got the router with the machine, with the uh, CNC. This is a DeWalt, I think it's a 611. Yeah, it's the 611 router. 
uh, which is pretty standard for a lot of CNC machines. You'll see a little DeWalt thing. Uh, some machines will use spindles, which a spindle um, is going to give you, um, a spindle lets you, it's basically a better version of a router. It's made to run at high speeds for long periods of time as opposed to a router, which isn't intended to run for hours and hours and hours at a time. But, um, you know, you still got to do what you got to do. All right, I'm waiting for the, uh, for the software to actually connect to the controller. And I'll know that because on the software, it'll turn in different colors. Sometimes it doesn't see it and I'll have to like wake it up and say, hey, it's here. Because I need that to actually move and set up my spot here. So I'm gonna just disconnect the USB and replug it. And usually that reestablishes the connection. And um, where did I, oh, here it is. So where did I put my iced coffee? There we go. So this turned colors. Now I know it's connected. So I can go back up here to this now and use this command section right here to now control movement of my, my router. There you go. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, try to establish as best I can, now I'm gonna change these increments to something smaller. Those were one inch movements. These are 10th of an inch movements. I can go down to a hundredth or thousandth of an inch movements when I wanna get really, really precise. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is make this a little lower so I can find that. I'm aiming for that center spot. I wanna get that, that bit directly over that little X that I made in there. And I think I need to go over this way and needs to go back. Well, now I'm gonna to have to go to a smaller movement. There we go. And that looks centered. And that looks like it needs to come over just a little. There we go. So that is now centered over that X. And that is gonna be my, um, my starting point, or my Z point, my zero. That's my zero point. The next thing I need to do is tell it, so I found it, okay, this is my Z point, this is your starting point. Now I need to say, okay, how thick is that wood? And not only how thick is the wood, but where is the surface of that wood? It doesn't know. This could be an inch thick, this could be two inches thick, this could be a quarter of an inch thick. It has no idea how thick this piece of wood is. So I'm gonna let it know by using a, uh, a setup block that actually comes with this machine as well. Let me go back to the tenth of an inch movement and raise the bit. I like that. Okay, this is my little setup block right here. And I'm going to put this inside. It plugs into the machine. And then this actually attaches to the collet. It's just a little clamp, a little alligator clip thing that attaches to the collet. And what happens is, <clears throat> the bit will go down and as soon as it touches this block, it sends a signal back and says, okay, we completed a circuit. That's my bottom surface there. And then it, it calculates where that actual surface is. So you have to kind of, you can, a lot of people will do this by using a piece of paper. They'll just lower it down until they can just barely drag that piece of paper under the bit. I find that to be not as useful, but anyway, you know, you do what you gotta do. All right, I'm gonna go to the carve now. I'm gonna click on carve, and it's gonna ask me a bunch of questions about setting it up. You know, what type of wood is it? Well, it's not walnut that I'm carving today. This would be cherry. So let me find my, it's not cherry plywood. Where's my cherry wood down here? Cherry wood, there we go. So I've got cherry. It is 0.75 inches thick, and it's very, uh, when you're, depending on what you're CNC milling, you really want to be very specific with your thicknesses. This, on the other hand, because I use this all the time, I'm, I know that I'm always using three quarter inch boards and I know exactly how deep this, this carve needs to go. So, so it is 0.75 inches. I'm gonna hit confirm thickness. My material is secure. It does this every time. I mean, it just asks you these questions. There are other programs. This is just the one I choose to use. I'm using a quarter inch down cut bit. Actually, I think this is a, uh, 
an up cut bit, not a down cut. And I'm gonna use my probe. You can do two different ways. You can do the manual, like I said, where you're dragging the, um, where you're dragging it across or where you're doing, oh, you're on the wrong screen. I'm just an idiot. There we go. <clears throat> there we go. So uh, yeah, so I'm gonna choose probe and I'm gonna confirm the position of the, uh, of the machine over the material. And then it automatically sees that the lead is plugged into the carriage. And I'm gonna confirm that the clip is attached. And then it says there's no contact. It wants me to make contact so it knows for sure that it has a connection. When those two touch, that there will be a connection. So you just touch this to the bit, this bottom plate here. And then I'll tell it that the plate is in place. It is under the bit. And then we will start probing. And it's just gonna lower itself down until it makes contact with that. Oh, come on. That is the deal. My power's browning again. This is really bugging me. I'm not sure why it's doing this, but uh, let me, uh, I'm gonna kill the lights on this side. Okay. I don't know, maybe I'm just drawing too much power here. It's the only time I've had this problem. All right. And it's a sunny day. It's not like it's storming outside. I don't understand this whole brownout thing. Anyway, the probe is good. I can put this away. I can tell it to put the probe away. Now, because I have this already set on my Z-axis, if, if I was gonna use the corner of the wood, this is where I would now move it over to that corner and find that spot. But because I actually have this set um, directly over my, my uh, X point there, my XY zero, um, I'm gonna go ahead and tell it that, hey, go ahead and set it, it's in the right spot. There it is. Now, I do have a dust boot for this, and I will tell you that if you're gonna do a CNC machine, you absolutely want a dust boot. Um, Cause CNC machines make a ton of mess. This is a dust boot by Suck It. Uh, it's a company that uh, they actually started making these things and th uh, 3D printing the pieces and such. They were great because a lot of people uh, make their own modifications with uh, 3D printers and such. They started making these. They did all the, the adjustments and stuff. They started selling them. And uh, <laughs> they were in a really good spot because uh, X-Carve um, Inventables had a dust boot, but it was out of stock. And it was out of stock for like a year. So nobody could get one. So this company stepped in, suck at dust boots, and started making these for some different machines and just really captured the market there. And they were at a lower price point, which is really nice. So I attach this to my vacuum like this. And then I actually have my own makes a little shift little thing. I have a little block here with a little U shape in it. And I put that against here. I have a little clamp. I just clamp that onto here. And then I hold this down. And it just basically it keeps my um, keeps my hose up and out of the way right here but allows me to get dust extraction from this so that I'm not spreading this stuff all over the shop. Now, one thing I need to do is plug in my router. So I will do that now. All right, router is plugged in. The shop vac is hooked up. And basically all I have to do now is answer these remaining questions, put my ears on and let this thing roll. So let's go ahead and Attach the dust, it's done. I'm gonna turn the spindle on and we're gonna make this carve, all right? So I'm gonna put my ears on because it'll get loud. Hopefully my noise uh, canceling software will kick in and this will not be very loud for you. So let's, uh, it doesn't take long to cut one of these, so let's give one of these a run. <laughs>
I'm going to step over here so hopefully you can hear me a little better. What that is doing is it is carving out that pocket. Uh, if you can see it on the, the rendering up top, it's making small circular passes, and each pass, it drops its depth down into the wood just a tiny bit more. Um, I was... I. I I start with a standard feed speed and then I usually up it from there because it's a little slower than it really needs to be. So I usually up the feed speed from there, but this is basically what's going to go on. I, I, I make these little, uh, these little pocket grooves in here. Like I said, I used to do this on my router table with uh, what I would call the drill bit of death. And uh, I would risk chip out and everything else, but doing it this way, I, I get perfect handles Every single time, they're the exact size and the exact depth I need. And so this has been a real uh, saving grace for my process. So if you just want to kick back and watch for a minute, uh, let me go ahead and uh, I'll switch cameras. I got another camera here quick. So all that's doing is running back and forth and creating that pocket in the wood. That pocket will, when you separate those two pieces of wood apart, there will be a, a handhold, a grip inside of the, of the base. Uh, the reason that I put those handholds in is because a sewing machine weighs, I don't know, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds. They can be very heavy. And trying to pick up a flat box off of a tabletop without any way to grip underneath it is really, you have to kind of slide it off the table to get it. So to me, uh, handles are a necessity. And uh, it's one of the things that people love about my bases. Like, oh my God, I love the, I love the handles. It makes it so easy to move around. So yeah, that's why I'm touching. Now, one thing I will say about the CMC process is it is not fast. Um, normally, what I will do in the event of uh, doing a lot of operations on the CMC machine is I will set up some other tasks in the shop to be doing while the machine is running. So it's kind of like having your employee go do something and you can do something else. So it does allow you to actually be more functional in the shop because you don't have to have hands on. There's a setup time. But you don't have to. Once it's running, your hands free you can go do other things. Um, now, I am limited in my electrical capacity here, so I don't normally have this running while I'm doing other milling operations or cutting operations. But if I need to be doing some sanding or, or some staining or other things in the shop, it is very easy for me to do that while this machine is running and taking care of the carving. So that portion of it I really enjoy. I went on the Inventables website the other day, and I was kind of sad to find that they no, off, they no longer offer this particular size of the X card. The, uh, this is what they would call their 750 by 750, that's in millimeters. And they made uh, two sizes. They made this size and they made a large size, which was a 1,000 by 1,000. And um, I, I for my shop size, this was perfect. I was like, you know, it overhangs the table, just a little workbench, and I have it on a little bit. But it doesn't take up a huge amount of space, and it works really well in my shop. I went to their website the other day, and they no longer offer this particular size. All you can get now is the 1,000 by 1,000, or you can move up to their Pro Series, 
which is a lot more. It's like a thousand dollars more for the pro series. And even those are large. So I think I was very lucky that I got this machine when I did. Um, and it was a, it was a sizable investment. Um, but I think I just gotten a bonus at work or something like that. And so I was really happy about that. And so I used that money. I was like, Oh, I'd wanted one for a long time. The bonus fell in my lap and I was like, all right, I'm going to buy myself a new toy. And, uh, this thing has paid for itself. It does amazing things for me and it does things I could never do without it. Um, the only possible thing I could maybe get that would do take over some of these tasks is if I got a laser cutter and I really want one of those too, a laser engraver, but those are ridiculously expensive. Uh, the one that I really would like, which is made by boss is about four grand, about $4,000 to get set up with the laser engraver. And that to me is like, at this point in time, I, I can't justify that much expense. I'd like to, but I can't. Uh, if I really get cranking on some stuff and sell a whole lot of product, I might look into it down the road. Um, that also would not go in my shop. There's just no room for it. So I would put that in my basement and then run the exhaust out the basement window while I'm operating it because they do create fumes because they're laser and they're cutting. And so depending on what you're cutting, you can get some noxious fumes. So you have to have them exhausted. So I would probably put that in my basement. That's where my 3D printer is as well. In my shop, I have some upgrades that I want to make that I think will fit into the shop really well. I would like to get rid of my, my jointer and planer and get a combo machine. I think I've said that before, but Grizzly makes one that's about 20, I want to say $2,600, $2,700. That is a 12 inch wide jointer and planer. And to me, that's just the best of both worlds. It takes up a just a little bit more space than my jointer does now. So it would fit into my shop quite nicely. Uh, the only problem with that is that it's a 220 machine instead of 110. So I would have to, or 115. So I would have to either get an electrician to run me some 220 into my garage, which would be expensive, or I could get a 220 extension cord, which I didn't even know this were a thing until just a little while ago, but I can get a 220 extension cord and run that to the machine from inside my laundry room where I have 220 run for my dryer. So that is also an option because I don't use it all that often. So I could actually make a little pass through in the wall where the cord could pass through and then I would just plug it into where the dryer is. I don't know that that would thrill my wife. Uh, it certainly would limit the amount of times you could use a dryer if I'm milling wood, but overall, I don't see it as being a huge thing. I don't, it's not like I run a laundry shop, so, um, but that would be a temporary fix to having a 220 machine in my, in my shop is to have a 220 extension cord and plug it into my laundry room next door where there is a 220 outlet. So it's an option. It's not, you know, the best of all worlds, but it is an option until I can actually get additional uh, electrical outlets run into my shop, which is in my plans. One of these days, I'm going to run a breakout box in my garage and then run additional outlets in here so I can have multiple things plugged in and running at the same time. That's my dream world right there. I can get a better dust collector and have that in the corner and have it working. I can use 220 machines. I can update my, my uh, table saw to a 220 option. I can update my band saw to a 220 option. Uh, because the, the, the big thing is I'm pretty much at max capacity on the motor sizes that I can use right now. Uh, about a one and a half horsepower is about the most you're going to be able to use on a, a 115 circuit. Uh, if you want to use anything like a three or a five horsepower motor, you have to go up to 220. That's the way it is. Anyway, so that's kind of in my plans for one day. Um, but we'll see. My shop is always an evolving. It's, uh, it, it, it's, I like to say it's fluid. It changes as I go and as I get the machines or as I uh, substitute things in and out. Um, it's an evolutionary process in terms of how I work. And uh, sometimes it's just to accommodate the projects that I make. I make changes for that. Sometimes it's to accommodate new tools, but it, it is definitely a, an evolving process. And I think if you look at anybody's woodworking shops, watch YouTube videos and such, you'll find that that is the case with a lot of people's shops over time as they change, they evolve, they find out what works, what doesn't, and then, you know, try to make things better 
as you go down the road. And that's, uh, those are my plans. It takes time, it takes money, it takes planning. Um, so planning and time, I got those covered. Uh, it's just the money part, you know, like with most people, it's the money part. Uh, I did see that the uh, Powerball is up to 200 million. So who knows? Maybe, maybe by next week, I'll be making changes to my shop. I'm not going to count those tickets. So. All right, let me go over and check how this is. It says we have about three minutes. The, the, the time calculation on these is sometimes it's pretty close. It gives you an estimate of when the actual project will be done. Um, I'm only going to do one of these. I don't want you to have to watch me do all five sets, which is how many I have to do. But in essence, it takes about 12 minutes to uh, do a whole, a whole uh, set of handles for a base. Uh, if I've got five, well, obviously... You know, you're looking at, what, an hour to cut all those? But like I said, if I was doing these by hand, um, I could be doing other things right now. Those would not necessarily work for me. So, um, yeah, let's uh, see how this one finishes out. It's making its last few passes. Um, the two things that, that really control how fast your carving go is your depth of cut and your, uh, your, your rate of feed. So the rate of feed is how fast you're actually moving around the pattern. The depth of cut is how deep that router bit plunges for each one. This depth of cut is really, really small. It's like maybe a tenth of an inch. It's really, really small depth of cut. And the reason you don't go really deep, I could probably go deeper, but then you're stressing the bit. And I don't want to stress the bit. I take really light passes and just work my way down. Um, it, your bits last longer. They don't get super hot. You have less chance of breaking things and just more chance of success. And to me, that's what it's all about. Uh, you know, it's not a race. Making things in the shop is more of a marathon. It's, I'm not a production shop. I'm not, I'm not on a clock. And so to me, if I can just take the time to do things the way they need to be done and let the machine work at its optimal speeds and feeds, then that's going to pay off for me in the long run because I'm not going to be breaking bits or breaking my, my router or ruining wood or anything like that. So, yeah. All right, let me see how much more we've got. I think we're almost there. done. Switch to this camera. All right, we are done. This is definitely a loud process. There's no doubt about it. It is, it is loud. Um, ear protection is a must when you're running this in the shop. All right, I'm going to remove the, the dust boot for now, and I will loosen these one side and I'm going to bring this over to you so I can slide this back and now I should be able to pop these out of here and the nice part is that I'll I can slide the next set in so once these are done I slide the next set in and it's ready to start cutting again my xy point is exactly the same it didn't change so setup wise once I get one set up it's easy to pop one out, slide another one in, and off we go. Let me show you what we're left with here. So I'm going to come to the close-up cam. I'm going to point this down just a little bit here. There we go. All right, so this is what we're left with. These were in the, the bed of the CNC like this. And uh, the pocket that it made, hang on, let me just check in here. The pocket that it made 
is centered on the wood because I took the, the time to find that XY point. So it's centered on the wood and it cut this little pocket out in here. I'm gonna get a piece of, um, let me get a little sanding block here and just knock this rough wood off the top. So the reason I use the bit that I do is that it gives me a very smooth, hang on. It gives me a very smooth bottom and you can see that inside here. This is very smooth. I would rather, if I have a little bit of uh, leftover uh, threads of, of wood up here, I just sand those really lightly and they come up and they look nice. But this bottom part is what I'm really looking at as being smooth and that bit I find does a great job. So, you know, you can see when these things are together, it's just cutting that pocket. But now what happens is I take them apart. I'll put one on one side and one on the other. And now I have handles and I can lift it up. So I, like I said, I used to do this on the router table and let me grab that. I'm going to show you the bit that I would use for that because it's a monster bit. Um, it's a half inch uh, spiral finger chunker. This is the, this right here. I'm going to show you this thing. This is the bit that I would use for that. And it is just one mean, it is sharp. It's carbide, um, like a triple cutting edge on there. It's mean. And what I would have to do is have this in the table and then I would have this wood set up and I would have to come in and make passes like this and up. And when it would come to this edge, it would catch these wood fibers and chip them out sometimes. They would just pop right out. And then, then I would cry and then re-look at how I'm doing things. Now it's no big deal. I just set it in the CNC machine like this. It cuts a pocket and we're, we're good to go. And uh, that, that, is, that is worth the time and effort for me over anything else. Um, yeah, that's just, I, <laughs> I kind of had an epiphany one day when I was looking and I was like, Oh my God, I could make these on my CNC machine. Yeah, so like I said, I'm gonna take the other sets and put them in there and make those. And I think, uh, how many sets? So this one goes here. And I've got one, two, three, four more sets to do. Those will take me, uh, it's about, like I said, you know, if I, if I average it to 15, uh, you're looking at about an hour of carving, which seems like a long time, but not really. Uh, considering how much time it would take me to do all of these, um, because I used to also do this after the bases were made, I would not do this part till the bases were made because I couldn't do this. I wouldn't do this on a flat piece of wood like this using that big giant chunky router bit. I did it with the whole box already constructed. Then I would make these and, um, for, for a number of reasons. Also, if you look at the thickness of this, let me go back to this camera. If you look at the thickness of this that I just, that I just cut, um, you'll see that I leave myself, how much do I leave there? About uh, three eighths of an inch of wood. So really what I'm doing is I'm taking half the wood out to make this pocket for this, for this handle. It's enough to get your fingers in and hold it and lift, but I have to leave enough meat inside here on this side, because when I put the base in, the, the, the quarter inch plywood that I put in for the bottom of these bases, that I come in about a quarter of an inch. So I need, let me see if I can get this to run here. I need to run an area that's about, this is, you know, one of these days I'll have a pencil that actually keeps the lead out and there we go. So that base is going to cut in about that far. Can you see that? It's going to cut into about that line right there. So I need enough thickness of wood right here where there's a separation between the, uh, the base and this handle. And I actually have an example of that. Hang on. I've got a base over here that I can show you what that looks like. Um, this one right here, I believe is like that. Yeah. All right. So this base right here has handles. You can hopefully see, I'm trying to get it so you can see it. There we go. So you can see the handles in there made with the exact same process. I did these on the CNC machine. So you can lift this up. It's got a nice grip there. If you look at the bottom, and this is actually, whoop, drop the lid. 
this is actually going to show up pretty well because this is, um, what is this on the side? This is mahogany on the side here. But you can see that that mahogany strip, this, this was cut in here. Then I do the cutout for the, uh, for the bottom of the box. And there is a thin strip right here of wood that maintains a separation between the handle and the bottom. And I, I, I do that on purpose. You know, I don't want this to dig all the way to the point where you're going to see that, um, that base wood. Because if you ever looked at the edge of plywood, it's not pretty. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure that that's not just sticking out there and looking ugly. But uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's kind of how the, the handles work. I will do all of those. And then I, what I will usually do is cut the, um, the joinery on the table saw. And actually, you know, we can probably do that. I can show you. Um, I'm kind of breaking from my norm, which is to batch things out. Normally what I would do is get all of these pieces cut on the CNC machine. Then I would move over to the table saw and do all of the joinery cuts for them. But because um, I want to show you my work process, I'm going to go ahead and take a little change from that. And we will do the joinery for one of these bases. And we will do the one I just actually cut the stuff for. We will do that. Which means I need to make a little change to a camera angle here. I'm going to walk around the camera. Sorry, I'm going to walk in front of you. I try not to do that, but I am going to walk in front because I want you to see what I'm doing over here. So I'm just going to point this camera down here. And right, like so. There we go. All right. Most of the cuts I make for the joinery are done on the table saw. And I use a, uh, a cross cut and I use my table saw blade as a, uh, I could, I could take the time to put a dado stack in here to do these, but I would have to have the exact thickness of the dado stack matching the thickness of the wood, which means I would have to measure that and put tiny little spacers in. And I, I just, I just use my eighth inch blade and I just move it over and make the cuts I need. Um, without doing a dado stack. A dado stack would make things faster, but there's a whole setup and everything else that goes with that. So for me, it, it's not necessarily the most ad advantageous method to use in this process. All right, I need to, I'm gonna move over to the table saw. Let me switch. No, I think I have that one set up for table saw. I do. Okie doke. So we are over here on the table saw. I'm going to move this fence out of the way because the fence is not really needed. What I do need is this. This actually, the T-square the came with the uh, saw. So this is a Delta T-square that's made for this saw. And uh, these are three quarter inch slots right here, which I think if you look, doot, that perfectly fits in that slot. It's three quarters of an inch, uh, which, is what this solid piece fits into, but this actually, the Delta has a little T-wing on the bottom here. It's like a little, almost like the size of a nickel under there, which fits into a little slot. So when you're using this, it just fits in like that. Uh, the, the board I added to it, this is just a piece of, um, of oak. It's actually quarter sawn, white oak. So you don't get a lot of movement in it. And I use that as a backer board and then there's a handle here, but I will push the wood through the blade and make my cuts. All right, so as I make these, what I'm looking at is these end pieces that I just cut are going to fit into this piece right here, but they're only gonna go in about a, um, I think it's, a half an inch, so it'll be a quarter of an inch this way, and then to the thickness. So I need to set this up so that I'm getting a half inch of cut depth on my saw blade, and I'm just verifying that. I have my little ruler here, and I just need to verify that. Yes, yeah, so it's a quarter of an inch left over on the edges. So I will have a quarter of an inch on this side, so I'm taking a half an inch of depth. And 
usually what I'll do is use a piece of scrap to make sure that I'm getting, I'll cut the, the line on a piece of scrap so that I, I don't use this. Sometimes I'll measure and it's like off just a little bit. So let me get a uh, measuring tool that I use. I have a nice one, pardon me for dipping in front of you here if I can find this uh, in my drawer here. There it is. This is made by, made by Craig. And it's a great little setup tool. It's basically just a, a scale on a slide, with a little screw here, and so you can set different depths. So I really enjoy using this. So I'll set this to half an inch and lock this down. And then what I'm doing is just trying to establish my table saw depth. I think it's a little high. So I should just barely touch the top of this. That might be good right there. Let me find a scrap piece of wood from our scrap pile down here. This is perfect. And then what I will do is I will cut a, um, a little section of this off and then I'm gonna measure with this, I will measure how deep that cut was to make sure that I'm getting exactly that half inch of depth cut on here. Uh, let me go ahead and get things set up. So what I have to do is I have to take my, pardon me, I have to take my hose off of the CNC machine for the moment because I need it to be over here at the table saw. So we will attach the hose, attach that to the back of the dust port on the saw. And then the other thing I need is my electrical cord. And I will detach that from the router from the CNC machine and we will plug that into uh, the table saw. All right, table saw, ready to roll. The only thing I need now is my remote control for the dust and I need my ears. Where did I set my ears? That's a good question. Um, put them somewhere. That's Mr. Obvious saying that. All right, there we go. Got my ears. Got my uh, dust collection in. I have my power set here. I've got a, a starting depth for this. I don't know that that's my finishing depth. I will make some micro adjustments, but I've got my starting depth for, uh, for the first joinery. So let's take a test cut and measure and see what it looks like. All right, all I did was take a very thin pass. You know, I'm gonna walk over to the other camera just so you can get a little bit better view here. I took a really thin pass. Hopefully you can see that on here. Um, took a thin pass, and then I'm gonna take my, my tool that's set up for half an inch and then measure that I'm exactly, in it. wow, that's, that's exact. There's no overhang. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not too short. It's not too long. It is exactly one half inch. It almost never happens. I almost never get them exactly the way I need to. All right. So that the depth on that cut is perfect. Now, the next thing we need to do is to establish where that cut is going to land on my board right here. So I need to. Uh, figure out a couple of things. I need to figure out where's the pretty wood. Pretty wood goes on the outside of the box. You don't want pretty wood on the inside and then so-so looking wood with some anomalies and whatnots. You don't want those to end up on the outside. You want your best face forward. And then also, you know, not only your best face, but what is going to be your, um, your front of the board and the back of the board. So you wanna kind of establish what those are gonna be as well. And I think, uh, I kind of like this for my face. Let's see what we got here. I like this one for the face and I like this for the back. So that's pretty decent. So let me go ahead and I can start cutting on one of these 
And what I'm going to do is I've got that half inch depth already established, right? But I need to make a, uh, now I'm going to make what would be referred to as a, a rabbit cut, sort of. Um, that's, I, I'm not sure exactly what they call this joint. It's kind of traditional in the bases for the sewing machines. It's what they use. The depth of this cut is going to be the width of my base. I don't want to go any, um, any wider than the width of one of these pieces of wood. So generally what I will do is I need a flat face here. Um, I will stand this up like this. I'll take this board like this because now I can say, well, this board is this wide. So that is how far over I need to be making my cuts. And generally what I will do is I will start there and then work my way out. And that ensures that I'm not going any wider. I'm not cutting into the board any more than I need to. It'll make sense in a minute. Um, I'm going to take this and align it on the tooth that makes that outboard cut right there. Just the widest part of the sawtooth blade. Just to get that lined up exactly on my mark. Um, the other thing you have to remember is that a pencil, when you make a mark using a, a edge of a ruler or an edge of a piece of the wood, the pencil lead isn't exactly on your, your edge. It's actually riding on the outside of that edge because you know, it is. So you take that into account when you make the cuts. All right, that looks good to me. I'm gonna go put the ears on. We're gonna thin this out here and then I'll show you how it fits together. Alrighty, that is my, my rabbit cut right there. Hope you can see that, a little 90 degree angle right there. The board will then sit, the side sits right inside there and makes this joint. And let me come over here and let just give you a, just a slightly better view of this. So you can see it a little bit better, a little more close up. Here is the joint that we just cut right here, and you can see. So we cut that. We know it's a half an inch deep. Um, let me get my little setup tool here. I know that this is a half an inch deep, and it will set like this. And my side that we cut the pocket in there for the grip will come in here and mount. And you can see that this is exactly this width is how wide I made that cut. So there you go. There we go. Um, and then what I will do is I will make the same cut on the other board that comes over here. I'll make the same cut on that one. I'll do the same thing on the other end. I will cut for those. And um, there is a tiny bit of overhang here, just a tiny bit. And that's okay because I will make that flush. I will get a, uh, a plane and just kind of smooth those out so that these are flush. I would rather have this just a hair long that I can flatten it down to this surface. If, uh, if I didn't go deep enough with the cut and this sat proud of that, that, that's more of an issue. This I can always get rid of. This is like a 30 seconds of wood right there overhanging that is just a, just a couple of passes with a plane to get rid of that. So, um, now what I will do is I'll take the other board 
Now that we've got this established, we look good. We've got our cut depth. I will take the other board that this is going to be married to. I said this was my, this is the back. So I kind of figured this out. It's kind of like, you know, make sure you get it right. So this is the back of the base. This will be the side here. Then what I need to do is say, okay, well, if this is going to be my face right here, and you know what, to make life easy, I'm going to write F on here. I'm just writing an F on here. That's face, and I, because the, it's, let me write a B on here. Is it this one? Yeah, B for base. And there we go. All right, so I have my base, or not base, back. So this is the back, this is the front, or the face, and that way I know which boards are oriented which way. The other thing I can do in order to keep these lined up so that I know I'm always, like I use this board to measure this piece of wood, right? Um, you can't see me though. All right, there we go, now you can see me. I wrote, I wrote a B on this one, I wrote an F on this one. I know that these are oriented like this. The other thing is this board right here, I use to establish the width of this cut. I wanna make sure that when I get ready to glue all these together, this piece, this end of this board is fitting into this cut. The way that I can do that is I can just label them. And so I'm gonna put an A here and an A here. And then I'm gonna put a B here. There's a B and down here I'll put a B over here. I know that the A matches the A, this edge of this board is gonna fit perfectly into this slot right here. I'm gonna use this end of the board to measure how far I need to cut into this piece. And in essence, all of these boards, like this one right here, might be just a tad thicker or thinner than this one. It's close to the same width, but it may be off just a hair. Because I use this to measure for this, I always want it to just be back in there. So I will use this board, and you know what I can do right now? I'll just label these right now so I don't even forget. So this is gonna be, we'll call this one C, we'll call this over here C, we'll call this one D, and we'll call this D. So now I will be able to keep these boards oriented I will use the correct side to measure for my cuts with the side that's gonna end up in that board. So I'm gonna make this cut right now before I get you all too complicated and confused. And you're like, what the hell is he talking about? I don't understand. Cause I get that way. I need to make this cut. I need to figure out how deep this is gonna be. I've got the side B pressed up against the side B here. I'm gonna get my, um, my pencil. I'm going to establish that line for the thickness of the sideboard. I have that line established. I will come over here to my table saw and I will find that cut spot right here. All right. And I establish where that cut is going to begin. Hopefully that won't move until I get set up and let's go ahead and cut this slot. All right, now we've established two of my rabbit cuts in here. I know that this is for B. Oh, see, I just screwed up. Okay, well, luckily these faces look good. This is no longer the front. <laughs> this is now gonna be the interior side. Oh, this is where it gets tricky and where if you don't pay attention, let me back that up. If I don't pay attention, I get screwed up. All right, this is now, the inside, this is my face. I have to pay attention to that when I go to make the next one, because, yeah. 
mistakes were made. All right, let me find this board here. Here we go. I've got A. I've got B. Let me write these down. This was D. This was B. This base right here, A and B, these are going to fit into here like this. And that establishes this side of the base. Now, something very important that I have to look at when I'm doing this is these measurements are made so that I achieve an interior width that is predetermined by uh, a, a drawing that I made of my box dimensions. So that interior width should be seven and one eighth inches. That's what I'm looking at. I need seven and one eighth inches between here and here. And if you think about it, I cut these to eight and one eighth inches long the other day when we were cutting these down. I then removed half an inch of material from each of these boards. So in essence, take half and a half is one inch. I've removed one inch of wood, which should leave this space in here to be seven and one eighth inches. Let's see if I screw things up. I didn't, I don't believe so. Nope, seven and one eighth inches exactly. And that is how much space I need because when I go to set the machine inside of here, it needs seven and one eighth inches of clearance, just actually a little bit less than that. But I find that to be the wiggle room I need, seven and eighth inches for that machine to set down inside. So this one, perfection. Now we're gonna cut C. So I'm gonna get this board out of the way. And we're gonna find C. This is my C block right here. It's gonna fit into here, which means I'm going to measure the width for this one. And I need to make sure, now, now is when it gets critical. You, if you, you can do the first one and sort of get away with an, an error. If you screw up the second one, you kind of ruin the whole project. All right, I made this cut on this bottom part of the wood. The next part has to also be on this part. If I have this one and then I flip this one over because I'm not paying attention and cut it on this side, I, I now have an L-shaped piece of wood I, I can't use anymore. So I need to make sure that I'm keeping these things in the right orientation and getting those cuts. Now, the other thing is I made that drawing for the depth on this side of the wood. Well, if I go to put this in here, that drawing I just made, that mark is now against the fence and I can't see, <laughs> I can't see that mark. So what I need to do is mark this one on the bottom using C. Let's find C. Here's C. Let's do this again. But on the board side of the board, that's actually going to be facing out so that I can see my mark like that. So now when I put this on here, I know that this edge is down right here. This edge is face down. This edge is going to be so I'm cutting the right side of the board but I also have a registration mark where that cut needs to go to, um, how far over, and I can see that now. Right there. All right. Yeah, it, it can get, especially when you're doing a lot of these things, you really have to pay attention to the way your boards are oriented, um, which is why I usually draw on the faces and such. They're gonna get sanded anyway, but the more visual clues I can give myself as I'm going, the less confused I am when I go to make these cuts and I end up hopefully not screwing them up. So let's uh, cut this one and then we'll measure and cut the last one. All right, this side of the base, the end, end parts are done. 
I need to do this one right now, which means that I'm going to cut this last one right here, this D. Um, I wrote D on there, but it's good. I'm going to lose that D. There we go. All right, so I need to find that board again. Where's my D? Here's my D. It's going to sit here. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to measure my line. So I know exactly how wide this cut needs to be for this particular board. This cut goes down so that I'm cutting on the same side of the wood. Get this out of the way. We're going to match up this cut mark to the teeth on my blade. Get it in the exact same spot that it needs to be. Crank up the saw, crank up the dust, and let's go. And you can see when I get when I get to cutting, um, that process goes pretty quickly because, like I said, I've got a nice quality blade, and I'm going to move this fence over just a minute because I'm going to use it as a a pressing point. So this is my C and D, C and D right here. So this one is on there, and here is my A and my B that fit like this. And voila, say voila, you've got a box, so to speak. So there's, that is the beginnings of this base. Um, I've got the space appropriate, and let me just squeeze these together so that I make sure I get the right. So I've got the space here, and I've got the space here, <clears throat> lengthwise on the inside, not as critical as you would think for this entire space. The, the space that's critical is the 14 and 3 quarter inches that needs to be measured to where the, the inside wall is going to go for, for that storage compartment. This is critical. I don't care if this is off by a quarter of an inch or, you know, a third of an inch or whatever. Um, this is this is not critical to the machine. This measurement, however, is critical to the machine. What I will do is I will measure out. So I need 14 and three quarter inches as my starting point. So I'm pushing against this. I'm, I'm applying pressure here so that I know that my, uh, my ruler is going to be in the exact spot it needs to be, and I need 14 and 3 quarter inches of space right there. So this is going to be the first cut that I make. And then I need to do the same thing over here so that I get 14 and 3 quarter inches right here. Get this closer. I mean, this is, this is my most exact measurement. Um, that and the, the seven and an eighth inches. Because this, this determines the fit of the base inside, or the fit of the machine inside the base. All right, I've got my 14 and three quarter inches. Now what I will do, this board right here is the one that's gonna go in the middle. It does not have handles. Um, it actually has a little knot on the side, so that'll probably go down, unless this is prettier. Yeah, I think this side will go down. I'm going to write a little M on the top here because that means this is my middle piece. And that way I know which one goes in the middle. I am also going to get my square so that I can make these lines exactly where they need to be. This is the hardest part of doing this whole process is this particular one. If I'm just doing a base without a compartment, I'd be done by now with all that, with the, with the join report. But I put this on here. I'm going to put it exactly on my 14 and 3 quarter inch mark. 
slide this over to it. I'm going to draw a line right here. That's where my board goes. Now, before I move this, I'm going to hold this. I'm going to take this board. I'm going to put it on here, right? And I'm going to draw a line on the inside. I don't know if you can see that or not. I'm drawing a line. Turn this a little bit so you can see. All right. I've got this on my mark, exactly on my 14 and three quarter inch mark. I'm going to take the board so that I get the width that I need. Or I could actually do it this way. This is the exact width that needs to go into this slot. I'm going to mark that line right there. So now I know exactly where the wood needs to come out of here. Now, the problem with this <laughs> is that I need to push it through this way in order to make the cut right on the bottom. But my lines are now here on this side. So the way I get around that is I'm going to do this exact same thing over here. I've got my 14 3 quarter inches. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put it right on that 14 and 3 quarter inch mark and draw my line. I'm going to take my base, my middle piece, set it on here to get my width. Draw that line. All right, this, and then sometimes what I like to do is just kind of make a little 3 quarters of an inch. And then I like to like cross out this area so I know that this is the part that's getting cut. Um, what I can do now is take these pieces, if those line up exactly, which they do, they line up, I get these sides right here exactly. What I can do is I can flip this and carry these lines across so that I'm getting the same cut on this board. Come in here. Right here, getting that same line right there. I can do the same thing, put this board down here. Let me make sure I get this, put this board. There we go. And now I've got cut mark that faces my saw. I've got marks there that I can see and make sure that I'm cutting in the right place. And like I said, to me, that's kind of like the trickiest part of doing this whole thing is making sure I need these, these wings right here, these cuts to be facing the table. They need to be down. This is where I'm going to make this cut. I'm going to get these out of the way. I'm going to get this one out of the way. And now I need to make this cut. And this is like the hardest cut. This is the one that I actually feel my way through. Um, I make the original cut that I know is on 14 and 3 quarter inches. So I get that one perfect. I put that right on the line there at 14 and 3 quarter inches. And then I start chewing away the wood and I will start measuring. I will get my middle board from right here. I will start measuring as I get close to that and just keep checking the width and then just nibbling away a little bit at a time and sneak up on that width. Um, instead of just saying, oh, well, I made that line. I'll just go right up to that line. You need to sneak up on it. Um, so I will start here, though, because I do have an established line at 14 and 3 quarter inches, and that's my established starting point. So we're going to start with that, and then I'll show you how I can kind of sneak up on that cut for this thing.
There we go. All right, that, I'm gonna walk over here and show you. So sneaking up on it is really important because I don't want it to be a super tight fit, but I also don't want it to be loose and wobbly where there's too much space. This is gonna get glued in. So you need a little bit of space for glue, but you also want this to be a nice looking joint in here. So if I show you that way, you can see that that fits, it fits in there really nicely, but it's a nice, it's, there's a little bit of space. I mean, you can see if I rock it just a little bit, there's a little bit of space. It's not super tight, but you want it to be a little bit loose because when you put the glue on the wood, it's gonna expand uh, just a tiny bit and you wanna have just a little bit of space in there. But this is a nice fit and that's what I mean by sneaking up on that cut. I just kept nibbling off just a tiny bit more each time. I know that this edge right here is gonna be 14 and three quarter inches along here. The space, on this end, I don't care. It's whatever the space was to get the perfect fit here to this end is how big this space is gonna be. It's not as critical. This is the critical measurement and that's why I do it that way. All right, now I'm gonna come back over and I've gotta cut that same thing over on the opposite piece of wood. So I have my mark here that I've already done. I can make sure, that's one reason why I kinda of color that in Oh, let me, I didn't switch cameras, but let me show you what I do. Is I make this mark right here. Um, so I, I know where the piece of wood needs to be eaten out from. So when I put this against the saw blade, if, that, if that's not there, I'm like, wait a second, I've got the orientation wrong. So that's why I do that, so that I can keep straight in my head what part of the wood needs to disappear. And then once again, I will come over here and I will find that spot that gets me right on 14 three quarter inches to start with. And then I'll start nibbling away at this until I get this fit for my piece of wood, which is right here. Get that out of the way. Alrighty. Last cuts. All right, that turned out just nifty. All right, let me show you final setup of what this looks like now that I've got all of this joinery done, is I will take these pieces that go like this, and this final piece fits in here and should slide down on there, fit in here, this fits over here like this, like this, and that, in essence, is the framework for my large base with a side compartment. And that's how I do the joinery. Um, what I will do is I will go ahead and cut the rest of these um, off camera so you don't have to watch me do all these. I want you to see the basic process of how I do these joints. Um, once I get them all cut, I will sand the interiors of the boards and then I will glue the exterior portions. I do not, I do, not do this piece until I am um, almost finished. This piece goes in 
almost last. Um, after I do that, I have to put the bottom in before I put this piece in. So this piece does not go in right away and it does not glued in with the sides. But when I do glue, what I will do is I will set these up and glue them just like this. I will put glue on the interior portions of these things. I will clamp them on a couple different sides and uh, we will get these set up for doing stuff. The other thing I need to do before I, before I do that is figure out how many, if any of these or all of these get the Singer logo into the face of them because I can't do that once the box is assembled. It makes the height too high. So what I end up having to do is um, before I glue anything together, I will take the, the face board, which is the one I have the F on. I'll take this face board over to the CNC machine and I will have it carve out my logo design right here in the middle. So that is one of the other things I do before I can actually glue these up because once that's, once that's on there, I can go forward. If I glue these together, Guess what? This doesn't get a logo because I can't get it. I can't fit it into the CNC machine after that. Um, and then the other step before gluing is I take all of these over and I glue. Or I don't glue. I sand the interiors of all of the base pieces. And the reason I do that is that it's just really hard to sand once it's glued together. It's hard to sand inside the box. Um, I don't do a a crazy amount of sanding. I will usually take these to 150. So I'll start at maybe an 80 um, if it needs it. Uh, I think I'll start these at 120 though. They're pretty smooth. So I'll, I'll hit these with 120. Then I'll go over and hit them with uh, 150. And at that point in time, they would be ready for glue up. And like I said, the, the interior doesn't matter. The interior, the base doesn't have to be as super clean. Um, let me walk back over here. It doesn't have to be as super clean and, and sanded as the exterior. Uh, the exterior is where I put all the love. Those get sanded up to at least 220 and sometimes uh, a lengthwise of 320 on there. But yeah, that's that's basically the process for, mil for, for my joinery. Um, and you can see these joints, let me just slide this down and kind of show you again. Um, let's go to the, let's go to the B cam. Not really a B cam. Uh, the, the joinery in these is pretty decent. Um, it, I've never had a problem. I've never had a joint fail. Let's put it that way. I've never had one of these joints fail. There's a lot of glue surface in here. And even though you've got end grain here, um, there's a lot of face grain here. So you're gluing face grain to end grain and face grain to end grain. I, I know that's a thing, but honestly, I've never had one of these fail. And I can tell you that I could bring out examples of these things that are a hundred years old and, and are pretty sturdy, um, but examples that are a hundred years old that are still just as good as they were. And I think they use hide glue, but I think the glues we use now are, are superior to hide glue. And uh, yeah, I've never had a joint fail. And uh, so I, I am a firm believer in this type of joinery for this type of base. It works really great. You could do something like a, um, a mitered box with, you know, you, you do 45s on the corners and then glue those all together. And you can put the, um, I can't uh, remember the name for the thing that goes in there. God, my brain is blanking today. But anyway, you could shore those up, but at the end of the day, I just like this joint. It's more traditional. And um, also, if you're 45, is it 44 and a half or 44 and, you know, a quarter? If you don't have that exact 45 degree angle and you start gluing those things up, you're going to get spaces in your 45s. It's not going to be a, a, as beautiful. You have to be very precise when you're doing um, that type of joinery. And this just allows me a little bit of slop, a little bit of leeway, a little bit of comfort zone for myself. And that's what I like about it. I got to keep all these pieces together because they're a match. Now, the one thing I will say is that using the table saw to make these cuts, and I don't know if, if you can see these or not, but it leaves a little bit of, because each one I'm basically making multiple passes, right? And so, I don't know if I can get it to a point where you can actually see the roughness of that, but the um, 
if I wanted to smooth this out, if it's really rough in here, or if, like say I didn't have enough pressure, even pressure going across and there was one spot that was a little higher than the rest of it, what I can do, and this one actually has it a little bit, there's a little bit in here um, going across. What I would do is get out this cool little plane right here, which is a router plane. And I can set my depth on this router plane just loosen this and I could set the depth on this router plane to a point where it is going to be exactly on the edge of that wood and then I could shave any high parts down and just use this router plane right here and I can just shave any, any high parts down and it makes this a smoother surface. So I can do that, tighten this down, tighten this down. And I can use this as a, uh, a way to get any of those, those little ridges from the blade, from the, the table saw blade. There we go. So if I have any parts that just didn't quite get enough pressure, downward pressure, and I got a little bit of a, a higher ridge, um, I can certainly use this. Actually, I got a little spot right here. It's a little high. There we go. And this just takes any, any of the high spots down. I'm not doing a lot, but... It gives me a cleaner surface now for, for gluing up. And so that, this is a great little tool. It's a router plane. Uh, this is a Veritas, which is a little pricey. And by a little, I mean probably a lot. But um, honestly, you can't find these things. The, the, uh, Stanley makes some. I, I can't remember the number for it, like a 68 or 66 or something like that. Anyway, you can't find them. They're antique. And they go for an arm and leg. People love these things. This is from Veritas. I can't remember how much it is, but it's worth every penny that I paid for it. Um, and I will use that, like I said, if I have any high spots from that using the, the table saw blade as a dado, um, if I get any high spots, I will use this to clean those out and get a smooth surface in here that'll be all ready for gluing. Uh, a lot of stuff we covered today. A lot of stuff. What do we do today? We talked about what my bases look like. We had a brown out and I had to restart. Um, I showed you how I cut these on the CNC machine. So how I set up the CNC machine and then we did a full cut. And then I, we covered how I do the joinery to make one of these. The only thing I didn't cover is making the, uh, the emblem on here, the, doing the logo. And that, those take about 45 minutes to carve. So I'm not going to have you watch. That would be terrible. I'm not going to have you watch me do that. But uh, I, will, I will do some logos and show you those. And then on Monday, when you come back, hopefully you come back. Please come back. Uh, I will show you the logos and should have all of these things milled up. And we can actually start gluing. I'll, I'll, we can maybe do some sanding and then do some. And I'll show you how I glue these things up. And try to keep them straight and not twisted, and then we can move on to the next step. Maybe I'll get a couple of them glued up so I can show you the next step, which is routing the rabbit for the, uh, the plywood base. So, all right. Uh, thanks for joining me if you came in. I'm sorry, I didn't have a lot of time to check comments. Hopefully, let me just run through real quick. I don't think I had any comments today. Um, there's no comments there. Anything on Facebook? Anybody commenting on Facebook? There's no comments on Facebook. I know I don't have any comments on Twitch because, you know, it's Twitch. <laughs> All right. No comments. That's cool. But if you did stop in to say hi, I appreciate it. And yeah, um, have a great weekend. And I'll see you back here in the shop on Monday.